Hi friends, thanks for stopping by. I'm Mark Noakes, author of Modern Guitar Method, and today I'm going to get into the music theory series a little bit more and put it all together for you. So we've talked about intervals, what they are, how they relate to the fingerboard, and now we're gonna put it all together and talk about how that makes sense, why that's applicable to chords and scales, and how we can structure our new found knowledge on the fingerboard to make you a better and more informed guitarist. So stick around and we'll get right to it. Okay, so you have already learned what intervals are, how they're applicable, and how you can use the smallest little functions of, of intervalic relationships, those half steps and whole steps, to build major scales. So that's what we've covered in the beginning of the music theory series and how the fretboard works. We're just going to move on to the next step here and talk about how we can use that knowledge to build chords uh, and really you could use it to to build other scales and things like that too but you know for the sake of this video we're going to talk about specifically chords and i have a few uh, things that i would like to illustrate for you and discuss that that are going to make chords make a little more sense uh, for you so uh just to recap the major scale we had a formula for it whole whole half whole 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 half so that formula builds a major scale it's just one way to think about it you could also just look at the circle of fifths memorize the key signature and understand which notes are sharp or flat in a particular key you're going to land on the same result set you're going to land on the same uh, seven pitches that build the uh, universe of that major key so to speak uh, so with that said, one way that you can get to a better understanding of your chord knowledge is to build upon that concept. And now let me say first, there are many ways to get to the same answer in music theory. It's kind of like, uh, I hate to use the, the math example because people like to say, oh, music theory is like math. And if you're good at math, you're good at music, etc. None of that's true. Math is just its own thing. Music is kind of its own thing. And there is some overlap, but one being good at one, it will not make you good at the other, I promise. Um, so basically, there are many ways to get to the same answer. And so I'm going to try to give you both in, in this video. So the first way is to build that major scale and then take the first, the third, and the fifth pitch from that scale and just stack them up. Those are the notes that spell a major triad. So that's the one of the simplest ways to spell any major triad. So as an example, let's use B flat. So you take a B flat major scale, you start on B flat, you end on B flat. So we have B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat. So we've got that major scale. We take the, the first note of the scale, the third note of the scale and the fifth note of the scale and we find some way to stack those pitches up on top of each other now just for the sake of spelling the chord those pitches are b flat d f so the pitches b flat d and f spell a b flat major triad now when we learn bar chords like this uh, or maybe one down in this position that's another b flat major bar chord um, with the third finger barring. Um, sometimes there are more or less pitches in that chord. So in this example, there are six pitches being played in that chord because there's six strings. We're playing every string, which means there are six tones happening simultaneously. But we just said that the, the chord only has three. In this example, we're playing four uh, pitches in this chord. Um, so how is it possible that you can have a chord that is spelled using three pitches and yet you're playing six uh, when you play this version of the chord or this voicing of the chord and you're only playing four in this version or voicing of the chord well the answer is simple you can repeat pitches and it won't change the function of the chord 
So for example, in this voicing of B flat major, we're playing B flat, F, B flat, D, F, B flat. So we've got three B flats in there, all right? So we're basically just tripling that pitch. And there are two Fs, and then there's one D, okay? So in that case, we're doubling the fifth, tripling the root, and we just have one third in that chord, okay? And so that's creating a fuller texture. It's just creating a, a different voicing of the chord. In this example, we're playing B flat, there's an F, there's another B flat, and then there's our D on string two. So we're basically just doubling the root and then we have a single fifth and a single third. So that brings me to the next point I'd like to mention. You can order the pitches in any way you like, okay? It doesn't have to be B flat on the bottom, uh, D in the middle, F on top. You can rearrange those pitches. You can structure them any way you like on the fingerboard to create any number of voicings. So for example, in this instance, we played um, B flat on the bottom, but say for example, I just want to bar these three pitches with my index finger and then put another B flat up on top on string one. I can do that, it's no problem. Now I have another voicing of B flat major, okay? So that's just one more example of how you can arrange the pitches on the fingerboard to uh, expand your guitar vocabulary. So you can start to mess around with different voicings, find different ways to play those triads. And this system works for, for every major chord. So you just, you can start with the scale, you can, you can build the chord off the first, the third, and the fifth of that scale, and it's gonna work every time for every major key. So it's a beautiful thing. Now, that brings me to the other method by which you can build these major chords. You can memorize your intervals. So if you memorize uh, how major thirds work, so if I said, what is a major third higher than D? Uh, well, if you just know that it's F sharp, then you just know how to build a major triad like really easily, right? So a major third above D is F sharp, a perfect fifth above D is A. Uh, so D F sharp A spells the D major chord triad. So that's just another way that you can spell the chords. Now I had another video, I can't remember the name of it, I think it was how to spell all the chords, and I mentioned a technique by which you can just memorize all the major chords using the circle of fifths as a guide. I highly recommend doing that. Start at the top, C, E, G, G, B, D, D, F sharp, A, A, C sharp, E, E, G sharp, B, B, D sharp, F sharp, F sharp, A sharp, C sharp, and then just go all around the circle, do the flat side, um, and then just memorize them. You know, they're not gonna change. Uh, they're the same chords uh, yesterday that they are today, and et cetera, so they'll be the same chords tomorrow. So just kind of like commit them to memory, and then you can spend more time fiddling with your guitar and figuring out cool ways to play them. Now, with that said, we're gonna move on to the next um, segment, which is how to quickly find the, the minor triads. So the minor chord triad is basically, it's just the same triad um, guts as the major, it just has the lowered third. So a moment ago I said, uh, if you knew that F sharp was a major third above D, you could build a D major triad, D F sharp A. Um, now, if we know that F natural is a minor third above D, we can build the D minor triad. So, uh, or we can think of the D major triad and then lower the third one half step. So you would lower that by either uh, using a natural to lower a sharp, or using a flat to lower a natural pitch, uh, or using a double flat to lower a flattened pitch. So um, double flats do exist, so, uh, and so do double sharps. So th there are all kinds of theoretical little nuts and bolts that, that exist that people think don't or you know, just don't know uh, about. And so, um, you know, just like there's a B sharp and there is a C flat, you know, it's just, it's all about the context, you know, we like to say, 
oh, there's only a half step between B and C. And well, that might be true, but in the written language of music, there are different ways to um, illustrate different ideas. There are just a multitude of ways to write the same thing, you know, and there, there are things that we can't identify by ear. And that's something that I want you all to understand is that playing by ear is, is awesome and it's important. And I, I highly recommend working on your oral skills and, and training your ear. Uh, but one thing you need to know is that the written language of music doesn't really have a lot to do with what we hear. I mean, there, there are obviously parallels because the written language of music is a system to um, try to explain what we hear. But there are many ways, again, like I said, a multitude of ways to accomplish the same thing. So I can write one pitch, you know, three or four different ways. And so that's something I want you to understand. So we talked about intervals. We talked about how they apply to the fingerboard. We don't have time to get to every possible combination of scale or chord or anything like that, but I just wanted you to understand that. I'm gonna give you one more bonus tip. It's about extended chords. So I know that you've probably played a song that had a A major seven or a G add nine or you know some something like E seven sharp nine. You know there are all these different kinds of chords that have extra notes in them. And so I want you to just think about those intervals and some of them just repeat, but you extend them up. So for example, once you complete the major scale from say A to A, well, that's a perfect octave. That's your octave. Well, now when you go to B, that's now what we would call the ninth. So it's up one step from A. So the ninth and the second are the same pitch but the distance is that of a ninth. And in music, when we voice chords on the guitar, we don't actually always have an exact distance of a ninth. So for example, if I have an A major chord and I put a B in it, that's A add nine. I don't necessarily have to have that octave and a second distance for that pitch or for that chord to be called A nine. Again, that has to do with the voicing. I can put that B pretty much anywhere in the chord. I can put it in, in the lowest note if I want. I can voice that chord really however I want, but when you analyze that chord, when you look at it, when you finger it, when you figure out how to play it, you can arrange those notes pretty much any way you want and just denote that on the chart as A add nine. Um, if the voicing matters, you need to learn how to write music on a staff because that's important if, you, if the voicing of the chord matters to you and you're writing a song. If the voicing doesn't necessarily matter, you can just write the chord symbol A add nine and let who's ever playing it play it how they like. So, okay, that's all for today. I hope that helps you. I hope it, it, it helps you understand the fingerboard a little bit better and intervals and chords and how they all relate to the fingerboard. I think that's a really important lesson. If you like the video, please hit the thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Uh, I really, really would like to, to be able to educate as many people as I can. Um, and so I, I really need to feed the YouTube algorithm to do that. So subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions for me, please leave them in the comments. I am happy to answer your questions. You can even go to modernguitarmethod.com. There's a form there. You could fill that out if you want to shoot me an email that way. Um, but my contact information is there. So I look forward to hearing from you. And thanks again for stopping by. And I will see you next time.